Please take your seats. What a blessing it is to be together again, to sit under the Word of God and defend. I pray that uh, our time this afternoon will be very sweet. Kindly turn to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18 to the end of the book. The Bible says, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded, or all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that the Lord has commanded. I've been asked to speak about how we commune with God in the ordinances. That is the baptism and the Lord's Supper. Many churches see baptism and the Lord's Supper as a mystery. And too many Christians think that these practices are only a mark of their religion and perhaps stamp some approval to their faith. They accept to be baptized because it is commanded in the Bible. But there is very little knowledge as to its significance. These ordinances are regarded and must be regarded as a means of grace. And we are going to find out what does that mean? What does means of grace mean? But very few churches fully understand the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Let me give you examples. The Roman Catholics and the Lutherans are too mystical to grasp its meaning. They think that Jesus is there physically in some way. And so then when the priest lifts up the elements, the congregants are supposed to kneel down and worship the Lord. That's a serious misunderstanding. The newer ones rarely, the newer churches rarely, if at all, conduct the Lord's Supper. When they baptize, they are too engrossed in outward, in the outward and the and the you know the water and all the dynamics of baptizing and lose the aspect of the baptism being a means of grace altogether. Going back to the Roman Catholics again, they end up with seven, ordinances, seven sacraments. They don't call them ordinances, of course. And uh, then other Protestant churches have also added foot washing as an ordinance. But a practice is an ordinance if it was instituted by Christ in his word, and there is an example for it, and it's commanded to be observed by the church. So where there is no instruction and example and instruction to continue doing that, then you don't do it. You don't take it as a sacrament, and that knocks out five out of the seven. And even the foot washing, uh, foot, foot washing is discounted. So what are the ordinances of Christ? What is their significance? Why do we need to administer them? What really happens when we enter the baptismal pool or river 
or eat the bread and drink the cup during the Lord's Supper. What really happens? Are these sacraments or are they ordinances? What's the difference? Are there some more or are they only two? We shall deal with all these questions. So let's talk about baptism. And we ask, perhaps it's necessary to ask, how many ordinances? The Lord Jesus Christ only commanded and set an example for two ordinances. Baptism, which is the symbol of our union with Christ, and the Lord's Supper, which is a symbol of our communion with Christ. And what is the significance of baptism? It should be observed that even though uh, this is an outward practice, it does have spiritual significance, which must never be ignored. It has meaning and significance to the person being baptized, to the church in which he is being baptized, and to the world. So baptism has meaning to those three parties. To the church, as a new individual is added to increase and strengthen its membership, and to the world, the person is no longer in the world. He is now in the church. And to himself, he is a new creation in Christ Jesus. So baptism is a covenantal ceremony between God and the individual being baptized and the local church where God says, I have saved this one. And I'm putting him in my fold. That is the church. So baptism and church membership are two signs of the same coin. They cannot be, they must not be separated. How is water baptism a means of grace? Baptism is a means of grace to the person receiving it in at least five ways. Baptism is to be unto the person being baptized, one, a sign of his fellowship with Christ and he, in his death and resurrection. That's what we read in, in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 4. It's a sign of his fellowship with Christ in his death and resurrection. He is buried and he is raised up with Christ to the newness of life. And then secondly, the evidence of being engrafted to Christ and his body, the church. So the baptism is meant to be the evidence of being engrafted to Christ and to his body, the church. That's what we have in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, those who believed were baptized and added to the church. Number three, baptism is a means of grace because it is an aspect of display of washing off one's sins and of the forgiveness of sin. A man called Matt Raymond, commenting on the aspect of the baptism being a means of grace, in a Ligonier article, says, Remember that John the Baptist said, I'm quoting, I have baptized, and that word baptized can also mean washed. I've baptized or washed you with water, but he will baptize or wash you with the Holy Spirit. Here is the reason observing a baptism is a means of grace for the believer. As we watch the pastor washing dirt 
of a person with water, it serves as a picture of Jesus washing our sin off us with the Holy Spirit, and our faith is the proof that Jesus is truly and permanently washed off our sin. So baptism, the water does not wash off your sins. The water symbolizes that you've already been washed off your sins. And then number four, the significance of baptism as a means of grace is it's a commitment of giving up self into God through Jesus Christ. Giving up yourself, your old self, and you're giving up yourself to God through Jesus Christ. And the, and the evidence that you have given up yourself is that you become one with the church. You become a member or a part or an organ in the body of Jesus Christ. Sinclair Ferguson writes of the significance of Jesus' own baptism by John to fulfill all righteousness. He says, here already Jesus indicates how he will become our Savior by studying in the river in whose waters Penitent Jews and symbolically washed away their sins and allowing that water polluted by those sins to be poured over his perfect being. And then lastly, baptism is a commitment to live and walk in the newness of life. That's what Romans 6, 4 says. So when you have someone baptized, at that very moment they are saying, I am church, I am walking with you because I believe in the same Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, I've become part of you and I would be going out to witness with you and I would be seeking to live a holy life with you until we get to glory. That's a commitment. So baptism also is a means of grace to the church. Not just to the person being baptized, but also to the church in the following ways. Number one, the church is reminded of God's power in their own conversion. This, this does strengthen their own faith. They know that there was a day when Jesus Christ came into my heart. This strengthens our faith and assurance of it. And hopefully, this gives an opportunity for improvement of our own baptism as we witness someone else being baptized. And then secondly, baptism to the church demonstrates God's continuing work of salvation among sinners. Baptism is a loud way of saying God's grace has not been depleted. As each person is baptized, we are reminded that God's power for salvation and His saving grace are still alive in our midst. And then thirdly, baptism is a means of grace to the church because the church is encouraged to evangelize. They can now go out with the assurance that just like God saved so and so last Sunday, we witnessed His baptism, we need to bring another one to the fold. So they go out to uh, to, uh, to witness in the strength and confidence that the Lord God will use the gospel. And then finally, uh, baptism is a means of grace to the church because it also provides an occasion for the church to sing praises of our Redeemer. As there is so much joy in heaven when one, repent, uh, one sinner repents, there ought to be joys on earth in the church of Christ when his grace is demonstrated and showcased in our midst in salvation. So then during baptism, if there is one thing that we should do is especially praise God and thank him for being such a great redeemer, saving sinners and adding them into our number. So then as such, gospel ministers 
need to be careful to administer the ordinance along with instruction from the scriptures as to its significance, both to the one being baptized and to the world church. Where did the Lord instruct baptism in scripture? Very quickly. The Lord Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ set an example and gave a command. He was himself baptized in Matthew 3.13. We read of his baptism by John in River Jordan. It's there also in Mark chapter 1 verse 9 where there was much water. He also gave a clear command and instruction before he ascended into heaven when he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So from that text that we read, the Lord is instructing the church to evangelize, to make disciples, but also to baptize, and to baptize in the name of the Father who loved them before the foundation of the world, in the name of the Son who in the fullness of time was born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law, and in the name of the Holy Spirit who applied that work of redemption to sinners. So it can't be in the name of Jesus only. Are you there? You've heard of people who say you baptize only in the name of Jesus? No. The Lord says you baptize in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And then number five, another question. Who are the proper candidates for baptism? Baptism is to be administered upon believers only. There is conclusive evidence from the New Testament that baptism is for professing Christians and not infants. It's for believers only or any other member of a believer's household who up until this time was not converted but is now converted like it was in the case of the Cornelius' house and others. So the Great Commission is explicit that it is those who have been evangelized, those who have been made disciples who are to be baptized. Mark 16, verse 16 is even clearer. It says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. The New, Testament, uh, the New Testament example is clear that only after the people heard the gospel, when the gospel was preached to them to produce faith in Christ, because faith comes by hearing, after they had repented of their sins, then they were baptized. At Jerusalem, for example, in the day of Pentecost, Peter preached and then they were cut to their heart. And then they were required to repent and be baptized in Acts chapter 2 verse 37. And the order is obvious. Repent and then baptized. If one has not believed in Christ, though he might be a child of the most godly person, Grace is administered by God. And salvation is not transferable. Salvation is like your ID, your identity card, or your driving license. You cannot give to your son and say, drive that vehicle. Because it comes from God with your own name, your own identity, and when you come to glory, you will present it as your own. You can't transfer it to your children. Baptism symbolizes union with Christ. The Bible says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul tells the Colossians, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith 
in the powerful working of God. So, faith is a necessary uh, ingredient, component for union with Christ to exist. So, faith then is a re prerequisite for baptism. So, those three points discount infant baptism. The other question is, has baptism been substituted by circumcision? The answer is no. It's not proper to equate baptism with circumcision. While circumcision was only administered to male children or to male subjects of those within the covenant community, those within the Abrahamic covenant, Baptism is to be administered to either gender, so long as there is profession of faith in Christ and repentance of sin. If the new covenant is, uh, is not identical with the old covenant, I mean, the Bible makes it very clear there in, in Hebrews 8, that what is becoming old is now obsolete, Hebrews 8.13, so clearly you cannot make them identical. The new covenant... Adoption includes regeneration and indwelling of the Holy Spirit so that we cannot break the new covenant as the Israel of God. So while we admit that just as circumcision was a sign of the old covenant members, uh, that is old covenant members, so also is um, baptism a sign of new covenant members. Baptism is only to be administered to those who have the following marks of new covenant. Number one, they know the Lord, as Jeremiah 31, 34 says. They are spiritually circumcised. That is regeneration, according to Romans 8, uh, 2, 28 and 2, 29 and Philippians 3, 3. Number three, they have the mark of being born of God. John 1, 12 and 13. They belong to the spiritual Israel of God, according to Matthew 21, verse 43, and Romans 9, 6, and 7. So those are the children of promise. They know God, the Lord, they are spiritually circumcised, and they are born of God, and they belong to the is, uh, spiritual Israel. In conclusion, baptism fulfills. You need to listen to this. Baptism fulfills and confirms what circumcision required. Baptism fulfills and confirm or confirms what circumcision required. So how is the ordinance of baptism to be observed? A person who professes faith in Christ is to be totally immersed or submerged in water of baptism and is baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and in the presence of the Church of Christ. As much, as, uh, as much water that will submerge a person, so sprinkling will not do. Sprinkling will not do. Immersion, which is what the word baptizo means. For immersion to take place, there must be much water. And such profession must be made publicly to, to the church. First of all, through the pastors, and then eventually to the whole congregation. Let me say that baptism must not be unduly delayed. When someone professes to be a Christian, the men of God, the pastors of that church need to move swiftly to know the person, to ascertain that the credibility of their testimony and move on to baptize them without too much delay. It must be said and assumed that one must be baptized in the Holy Spirit first before water baptism. Because baptism in water is only meaningful when 
there has already been baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Paul tells the Romans, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This baptism is not water baptism, but the Holy Spirit's baptism. The baptism into Christ's death. This is what happens to everyone who becomes a Christian. And it happens at the point of their new birth. They die to sin. They die with Christ. And how does that happen? Just as Jesus died to this world of sin, was buried and rose again to newness of life, so also you become a Christian when you die with Christ and are raised with Christ by the Holy Spirit who raised him from the dead. And then we are united to Christ by the Holy Spirit. You die to sin and are enabled to walk by the Holy Spirit in his work of sanctification in the newness of life. Therefore, a genuine Christian cannot continue to live a life of sin after conversion, as we heard yesterday when Pastor uh, Kalifungo preached, baptism is also the door into the local church. The phrasing of the Great Commission suggests this. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Where will they be taught? In the church, isn't it? So the primary ministry of a local church is teaching, is a teaching ministry. Yes, you may help the needy, you may establish a, 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 a seminary or a school, uh, you may do all those kind of things, but the primary business of the church is teaching and making disciples. I also need to add that baptism is not essential to salvation. The only basis and foundation of our salvation is faith in Christ alone. Lived for our righteousness and dying to pay the penalty for our sins and was raised for our justification. Nothing can be done to add to his work of redemption. Those who die without being baptized, like the dying thief upon the cross, where did he go that day? Today you will be with me in paradise, is what the Lord said. But if you, are, you, have, you profess to be a Christian, but you don't want to be baptized, you might not be going to paradise. Because those who are going to paradise are going to be with the Lord. And remember, the Lord wants you to be baptized. Doesn't it? If you lack a chance, like it was the case for the, 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 the dying thief, the penitent thief, that's understandable. Let's come to the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Baptism, as I said, is an ordinance that signifies our spiritual union with Christ. But uh, the, the Lord's Supper is the ordinance of communion. That's why it's called the Holy Communion with God. Through a continuance in the grace we receive from Christ by faith. It's called the Holy Communion or the Eucharist. But the preferable designation is the Lord's Supper, since it separates it from all other meals, and it's a supper of Christ with his bride, the church. In the Lord's Supper, we feed on Christ, who is the bread of life. He said that he is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. He is the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of his bread, he will live forever. Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you, the Lord said. For his flesh is true food, and his blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on Christ's flesh and drinks his blood abides in him, and he in him. There is a text in John chapter 6, verse 48 through 58, to tell us that it is indeed a communion meal. And where did the Lord instruct the observance of the Lord's Supper in Scripture? 
Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And you will see Paul saying, For I received from the Lord what I also gave to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and, and he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and following, he had in mind the institution of the Lord's Supper by, uh, by the Lord in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 29, and Mark 14, 22 to 25, and Luke 22, verse 14 to 20. The command from the Lord Jesus that we should be participating in the Lord's Supper is unmistakable. Do this in remembrance of me. Why is it called the Lord's Supper? Because Christ instituted it by giving us its menu. That is the elements of the bread and the cup. With the, with the bread signifying his body and his blood, uh, and the cup signifying his blood. It is the Lord's Supper because the Lord commanded its observance. He commanded that we eat and drink in his remembrance. It's so important that each of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, refers to its institution. So what is it? What is the Lord's Supper? When I eat the, uh, the bread and take the cup, if I am sick, will I be well? That's a question yesterday, isn't it? No, not necessarily. It's not medicine. The Lord's Supper is one, the Lord's meal. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says that when he received, what he received from the Lord is what he precisely gave and delivered to us. It is the Lord who instituted it. It's the Lord who uh, commanded its observ observance. It's the Lord who gave its menu. Number two, it's a communion meal. We are to be in communion with the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with one another in the church. The communion or fellowship meal shows that all enmity has been removed and peace with God has been given. And so that we are now His children and He our Father and we eat together with Him. It's a Lord's meal. It's a communion meal. And then it's also a thanksgiving meal. And when he had given thanks, the Bible says, he broke it. For each of the elements, the bread, the cup, the Lord was, uh, was quick and instant in giving thanks. We thank God for giving his only son. We thank the Lord Jesus for willing to die our death and to give us his righteousness and pouring his spirit upon us. So the church is a thankful community. And as often as we eat and drink, we give thanks. It's a thanksgiving meal. And then fourthly, it is a church's regular meal. This ordinance is something that we are to participate in regularly, together as a church. I would even argue every time we gather as a church, it's not to be done with unbelievers or privately in your home. Don't, don't decide that you'll have the Lord's Supper after your meal alone. The Lord's Supper is to be eaten with God's people in the guidance of the elders, the pastors. And uh, it is really not a family meal. Neither is it a personal meal. It is a communion meal of the church. So the church needs to regularly make sure that they celebrate the Lord's Supper. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 
verse 16 to 17, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many, underline that word many, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. You can't do it remotely. You have to do it with the other members of the church. It seems to me that its regular, regularity is not arbitrary. We gather weekly for worship. When we feed upon every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, in the same way we should celebrate the meal weekly at the context of Paul's mentioning as often as you drink it. Implies frequency is preferable, not in frequency. It's also fifthly a memorial meal. Do this in remembrance of me, the Lord said. It's a statement that the Lord repeated in commanding it. We eat of the bread and drink the cup in remembrance of the Lord to honor him who loved us and died for us. It's a meal that helps us to keep the person and the work of Christ at the heart of the church and life of believers. It's a meal that, that, that makes Christ very much present in our midst as we remember him. We remember his death. We proclaim his death until he comes. But also number six, it's a covenantal meal. The Lord said that the cup is the new covenant in his blood. A contrast with the old covenant which established laws and ceremonies separating the Jews from the Gentiles. It was faulty as it did not guarantee anything since the blood of bulls and goats could not atone for anyone's sin. And so even the Jews did, con did not continue in it, the Bible says. The new covenant predicted in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33, is a better covenant. Hebrews 7, 22 and Hebrews 8, 20, uh, 8, 13 would say that very clearly. The Lord Jesus Christ is the great high priest and the perfect sacrifice for our sins in the new covenant. It is based on faith in the shed blood of Christ to take away sin. Because the blood of Christ is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And finally, it is an eschatological meal. We read that as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, what do you do? You proclaim. What? The Lord's death. Until when? Until... He comes. What does that tell you? You are eating this meal as a church, as a body of Christ, and meanwhile you are waiting for the return of the groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an eschatological meal. This communion meal is meant to prepare us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There in Revelation 19 verse 9. Because then the Lord said, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the, of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you, that is the church, in my Father's kingdom. Amen. It is an eschatological meal. So that tells us the significance of the Lord's Supper. And it tells us that we need to be participating in it. What is the relationship between the Passover and the Lord's Supper? And this question is an important one because just like there is some correspondence between circumcision and baptism, there is also some correspondence between the Passover and the Lord's Supper. But then, when you have the reality, you leave the shadow. This is what you have here. Just as the Israelites survived death in their households through the blood of the Lamb that was on their door frames, so we also have been saved from the wrath of God through the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So the Passover was a meal, and so is the Lord's Supper. 
both speak of God's rescue of his people from enslavement and tyranny. Enslavement in Egypt is a picture of enslavement to sin. The blood of sacrificed animals in the Old Testament is a picture and a type of the blood of Christ in the New Testament. This is the meaning of the Lord's Supper. It is a reminder of the way in which we've been rescued from enslavement to sin, from God's wrath through the atoning sacrifice of the Son of God on the cross, and how we are preserved as we depend on Him through our sojourning in this barren land. I, I must deny any false teaching and errors regarding the administration of the Lord's Supper, for nothing mysterious happens when someone prays, when the priest prays or breaks the bread in full view of the congregation. Jesus is not crucified again. There is no sacrifice offered. There was once for all sacrifice offered. It can never be repeated. The bread and the drink are not becoming the literal body and the literal blood of Christ. They remain what they are. They are there to signify. They are as symbols. And this is a reminder and not a reenactment. Re it's not a reenactment of the sacrifice of Christ. It is a reminder of his sacrifice. He died once and for all. God was fully satisfied with the price he paid for our sins. He will never suffer and die again. I think I have three minutes to tell you how the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. First of all, Christ is spiritually present. He's not actually present, as the Catholics and perhaps the Lutherans would say. But uh, the Lord is present in the sense that he commanded it. We are obeying his instructions. He said we do that to remember him. And so then as our senses are engaged in remembering him, then the Lord is there to be remembered by us. And that's why then when we examine ourselves and confess our sins, we know that he will forgive us. He said that we examine ourselves so that we may partake of the supper in, an, in a worthy manner. You notice that he didn't say, you examine yourself and then leave. Right? He said, you examine yourself, perhaps find that you, are, you have sinned, and then, the Bible says, eat. Because the Lord is present to save, he's present to forgive, he's present to help us in our weaknesses. And then Christ is received by faith because he is only spiritually but truly present with his people that he has redeemed because he never leaves nor forsakes us. It is only faith that can receive him and the benefits of his death. We must believe that the elements are not just food, which is the Corinthian mistake. The Corinthians would just eat and eat as much as they wanted, drink as much as they wanted, get drunk, and then go. Don't wait for anyone else. That was their, their, their mistake. They took the, this meal as only physical, and that's it. And that's wrong. We must believe that the elements that the Lord commanded, that have been consecrated for his reminder, are used to draw his people closer to him, to give hope to his people, and to enable them to continue waiting for his glorious appearing. The benefits of receiving Christ are here put across. When we put our trust in Christ, when we hear his word and believe in the Lord, only in the Lord's table, the same word 
is in symbol form. So that question in the catechism, what are the benefits that accrue from his death? What are those? Justification, reconciliation, adoption, redemption, glorification. To know that we've received such benefits through Christ's death is to increase humility, for we do not deserve anything. It is to increase our joy as we wait for the blessed appearing. It is to strengthen our assurance, and it is to sharpen our zeal to serve him. Who qualifies to participate and conduct the supper? Ba baptism and the Lord's Supper are for Christians. Baptism for young Christians, the Lord's Supper for continuing Christians. We have stated that the only difference is that baptism takes place at the beginning, the Lord's Supper as you continue. But it's not for everyone. It is for believers who are walking with the Lord. And then finally, is there only one way of conducting the ordinances? Yes, it's set down in the Bible. Don't try to add to it. Let us bear in mind this. That the risen Lord designs and institutes the habits and the conduct of his body, the church. He does that to remind us constantly of what is the most of the most importance. And so at baptism, we are reminded of our ingrafting into his body as we are initiated into his community and welcomed into his family, the church. But at the Lord's Supper, we remember as a local church together the gospel as of first importance. The good news at the very heart of our faith that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he raised from the dead on the third day, and he still lives right now at God's right hand to intercede for us as our great high priest, whose name is love. Like the Passover, the old covenant memorial meal for the nation to ceremonially remember its great rescue from Egypt, so we in the new covenant have the Lord's Supper. We have the Lord's Supper as a ceremonial reminder of our own great redemption and exodus in Christ from sin, from death, from the wrath of God to paradise and eventually to the eternal kingdom of God where righteousness dwells. Amen. Our Lord, we thank you for you have not only given us your word, but you have also given us your word in symbols, in baptism, and the Lord's Supper. Where we have been mystical in these things, Lord, we pray that we will, you will help us now to be more knowledgeable, not ignorant. Where we have been uh, abusing the Lord's Supper, please forgive us and help us now to walk with a new knowledge and to live accordingly. Where we have uh, failed to use these means of grace as we should, we depend on you, Lord, to help us now to use them properly. Please help us, Lord, that uh, your church, the bride, would be beautiful, would be adorned to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.